Hi everyone, welcome to Medicine for Dummies. I'm Dr. V. So this is part 3 of the lesson on acute gastroenteritis. And if you haven't checked out part 1 and 2 yet, you can click here and refer that. So hit a like, subscribe, and share, and stick around for more as we talk about a new topic every week. Don't forget to check out my other channel for great music, for relaxation and studying. So, today we are talking about the management of a patient with acute gastroenteritis. The principles of management are simple. You have to treat the cause, correct the complications and address the risk factors. So, in this case, we have to correct any severe, life-threatening situations like dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. If it's a bacterial diarrhea, we give antibiotics. Note that antibacterials don't work for viral diarrheas. We can also give things like probiotics, zinc supplements, and in some countries, bacterial diarrhea should be notified because they can cause outbreaks and is usually a feature of poor hygiene. In the long term, we have to give them health education and prevent recurrent episodes through vaccination. So now, let's move on to the discussion. Up to now, you know I mentioned a few things that I said we will be considering later, so any questions you might have are going to be addressed in this section, so buckle up. <laughs> this is the theory behind everything and some of the questions that you all might be asked in your vivas. So, how would you manage dehydration? In the mild type, as I said in the previous video, there is nothing overly serious, so you encourage fluid intake with oral rehydration salts or solution. Oral rehydration salts are special mixtures with specific contents with a balance of electrolytes that is physiological, so it is better than water. So we have packets like these with these constituents that is dissolved in a specific amount of water. These are flavored so the child will like to drink it. Earlier we used an isoosmolar type of solution, but now what is recommended is a hypoosmolar oral rehydration solution with these osmolarities. So. In severe dehydration, if the patient is in shock, we have to give a bolus of fluid, meaning it's given all at once. The volume is according to the child's ideal weight and is 20 ml per kg. So if the child is 10 kilograms, we give 200 ml of normal saline within about 5 to 10 minutes. So after the patient's blood pressure has picked up, and the initial worrying stage has passed, then we slowly correct the dehydration. So for this, we need to do a calculation. We calculate a fluid coda for 24 hours. There are various ways you can calculate, like the WHO method and the APLS method. So today, what I am showing you is the APLS method, or Advanced Pediatric Life Support Method. Personally, I think it replenishes the water in a much more gradual and effective way. While in contrast, in the WHO method, you give a large volume of fluid all at once and there is a risk of fluid overload and heart failure. So the equation for this is deficit plus maintenance plus ongoing losses. So deficit is just what the name implies. How much water is the baby lacking to begin with? The maintenance is the amount of water the baby needs to maintain his normal hydration within 24 hours. Because we are calculating it for 24 hours. Ongoing losses is what the baby loses again with things like episodes of diarrhea and vomiting. So when you add up all these, you will get the fluid coda you have to give to make the baby rehydrated. So deficit is calculated by the weight loss. Remember we categorize dehydration into mild, moderate, and severe according to the weight loss? 
So according to that, if the dehydration is mild, we give 50 ml per kg. If it's moderate, we give 75 ml per kg. And if it is severe, we give 100 ml per kg of normal saline. The maintenance is calculated with something called the 421 regime. And note that this has to be calculated for ideal body weight. That means that if there is an obese child whose actual weight is 45 kilograms, but the weight he should be is 35 kilograms, we have to take 35 kilograms for our calculation and not the 45. You can easily get ideal body weight by weight for height graphs. So basically, what the 421 regime describes is that for the first 10 kilograms of this ideal body weight, we give 4 ml per kg per hour. The second 10 kilograms, we give 2 ml per kg per hour. And every other kilogram above 20 kilograms, we give 1 ml per kg per hour. Note, all of these are for an hour. So to calculate for 24 hours, we have to multiply by 24. The ongoing losses we have to give are the volume of fluid that is lost. So usually, we estimate that in one episode of diarrhea, 50 ml of water is lost. So with each episode, we add another 50 ml to the calculation. So let's consider an example. We have a patient whose actual weight is 45 kilograms, but the ideal weight is 35 kilograms, and he has had severe dehydration. After admission, he has had two episodes of diarrhea. So the deficit is 10%, and you have to give 100 ml per kg of fluid. So that would be 3,500 milliliters. The maintenance according to the 421 regime is like this. So for the first 10 kilograms, the volume is 40 ml per hour. The next 10 kilograms, it's 20 ml per hour. So the remaining number of kilograms is 15. So we have to give 15 ml per hour. If we add all this up, we get 75 ml per hour. And for 24 hours, that is 1,800 ml. The ongoing losses are two episodes of diarrhea, so that would amount to 100 ml. So his total fluid quota for 24 hours is 3,500 plus 1,800 plus 100, which equals to 5,400 ml of fluids. Usually, what we do is give the deficit and maintenance through a cannula and ask the patient to take the ongoing losses orally, then and there, with each episode if the child is able to drink. If not, you can add it to the fluid given through the cannula. So now, we have the volume of fluid we have to give for 24 hours. So how do we give it? We have to give it slowly throughout the day so that the baby won't get overloaded. In other words, we can't give it suddenly like a bolus. There are different methods of giving suggested by different organizations, but the best would be the APLS method, which states that in the first 8 hours of your 24 hours, you have to give half of the deficit and one third of the maintenance. In the next 16 hours, you have to give the other half of the deficit and the rest of the maintenance. So if we calculate this for our example, it would be 2,350 milliliters. So we set the drip so that the baby gets 2,350 ml of normal saline within 8 hours. The rest is given within the next 16 hours. So we give intravenous fluid if not taking orally and convert as soon as possible to oral because physiological methods are always better. So now that we know how to correct the acute life-threatening problem, we will go on to talk a bit about acute gastroenteritis. So the organisms involved could be viruses, bacteria, fungi, or parasites. The most common viruses are rotavirus, 
norovirus and adenovirus. This is the reason why we specifically ask if rotavirus vaccine has been given to the child. And then there are bacterial pathogens such as Campylobacter, E. coli, Shigella, and Salmonella. Fungi could be Candida and Cryptosporidium, and parasites could be Giardia and Entamoeba histolytica. But those organisms aren't that common. So how do we clinically differentiate if this is a viral or bacterial diarrhea? This is where your description of the diarrhea comes in handy. Here you can see that viral diarrheas usually involve the small intestines, where the majority of digestion and water absorption takes place. So viral diarrheas are usually watery and profuse and contains undigested food particles. In contrast, the bacterial diarrheas involve the large intestine, so there might be blood and mucus, and the diarrhea will be less watery, thick, and scanty. Some other features are that bacterial diarrheas are commonly associated with abdominal cramps and tenesmus. So, the treatment for bacterial diarrhea? Antibiotics. First line for a mild episode is furazolidone. It's taken orally and directly acts inside the intestine to destroy bacteria. Then for severe episodes with systemic involvement, you can give a third generation cephalosporin like kefotaxime or keftazidine. And you can also give the other drugs mentioned here. Note that nalodixic acid is not given in infants because it may cause benign intracranial hypertension. Other supplementary things we can give are probiotics. Probiotics are good kinds of bacteria and yeasts that are helpful in digestion, so you can find these in yogurt. You can also give zinc supplements because it has been found that zinc can reduce duration and severity of diarrhea, enhance mucosal recovery, and reduce the likelihood of further episodes for around 3 months. So, in our imaginary patient, this would really be helpful because he has been having recurrent episodes. And then, as an intern medical officer, you need to notify cases of blood and mucus diarrhea, also known as dysentery, so that formal investigations can be carried out to identify the cause. In Sri Lanka, this is done in the phase you are first suspecting the disease. You don't need to confirm it because it will take time. So, it's done by filling a form known as H544 and is written down on the ward notification register. Then you record it in the institutional notification register and you send the form to the relevant MOH areas, which means an area looked after by one medical officer of health and the nurses, public health inspectors, and midwives under him. So the MOH can investigate into it. So the last part is health education. We have to teach them about good hygiene, proper hand washing techniques, sanitation, and food preparation. If there is recurrent diarrheal episodes, we can suggest vaccination with rotavirus vaccine for prevention. Other topics that could be asked during your viva could be these, and we will briefly talk about some of them. Malnutrition is a separate case in itself, and you can find more about it in my upcoming videos. So first, let's consider secondary lactose intolerance. This is also called post-gastroenteritis syndrome. So what happens is, with the diarrhea, the villi in the intestine temporarily become atrophied. So the absorption capacity is reduced. So if you give milk to the baby after an episode of diarrhea, the baby tends to get diarrhea. So this is diagnosed by observing stool for reducing substances. That means there are undigested sugars in the stool. 
So we treat this by starting fluids again for about another 24 hours so that the deli can regenerate and only slowly introduce milk products. Intussusception, as I said before, is the invagination of one part of the bowel into an adjacent part, so it causes bowel obstruction and necrosis. They present with colicky pain, which comes and goes, and you can observe this in that the baby cries intermittently with the arms and legs scrunched up, and then in a minute is back to normal. Another thing, as I said, is red currant jelly stools, but that is a late feature even though it is specific. In examination, you may find a sausage-shaped mass in the abdomen. Con to confirm this, you can do an ultrasound of the abdomen and you will see a typical appearance known as the target sign. Treatment is by air insufflation where we insert air through the anus and it kind of acts like a balloon or tube where the invaginated part is pushed due to the air pressure to its normal position. If that doesn't work, we may need to go for surgery. The last topic is hemolytic uremic syndrome, which I told you I will talk to you about. So there are three main features of hemolytic uremic syndrome. These are renal failure, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. So what happens in this is that the coagulation pathway is activated and there will be thrombus formation. If it happens inside the vessels of the kidney, it gives rise to kidney failure. When it happens in small vessels, which is the meaning of the term microangiopathic, the red cells have a hard time traveling through those vessels and it leads to red cell destruction or hemolysis. When this goes on, it leads to anemia or low Hb in the body. So the reason for the thrombocytopenia is platelet consumption during these thrombi formation, so it leads to reduced platelet count. When it is associated with diarrhea, the organism most likely to be the cause of the diarrhea is O157 strain of Escherichia coli. Diarrhea associated hemolytic uremic syndrome has a better prognosis than when it is not associated with diarrhea and the progression into chronic kidney disease is less and there are less complications like hypertension. So that is almost everything you need to know about acute gastroenteritis in children. Of course, there is a lot more out there for those who are hungry for more information. So check out my other videos which I will be uploading soon. Note that the exact management may differ according to your specific areas, but the principles are the same. So until next time, stay safe. Thanks for watching.